And we'll try to talk about them all. Thanks, Moses. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Um, so <laughs> yesterday, when we spoke, uh, I, we, we talked a lot about critical approaches to media literacy. We talked about uh, different ways that we understand the topic now. And we talk about um, some of the ways we need to, criti we need to critically approach the, f the idea of media literacy, responding to new pressures of, of digital culture. Um, this talk, I'm going to be much more provocative in telling you why I think, why I tend to agree with the gentleman who said, perhaps media literacy has been perpetuating these problems that Moses mentioned this morning. Perhaps the way that we've been approaching media literacy has been contributing as much to some of these new struggles um, that we see in ownership, in control, in um, how media is framed, in algorithms, and that we need a way to kind of reimagine the work of media literacy to respond more directly to an age of distrust. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to make this argument in my talk today um, and maybe a little less interactive. Uh, I'm also going to, um, and I'm going to put forth a new approach that I've been, this is actually the title of, of my next book that will be out in the, in the spring, uh, where I actually advocate that we need to reimagine what media literacy is for an age of distrust. That, that my correlation is that media literacy has made great strides. And, and my, my talk today will be provocative. And in no way do I think that the core approach to media literacy is wrong. I think it's necessary. I think at a younger age, it's more necessary. But my argument today will say that at a certain point, media literacy needs to take on civic intentionality and stop being value neutral, or else it, may, it perpetuates the same problem we see. Case in point, at the end of Moses' talk, when we were talking about, when he was talking about the funding and the money in these big media companies, and in the United States, I, was, I told Moses this after, and I think it's really important for us to know, Comcast actually funds the media literacy organization. So the National Media Education Organization actually takes money from Comcast to do its conferences. So if we think they're just thinking about media companies, they're associating their brand with media literacy. This is amazing to me. Verizon gives money away to educational initiatives about media and production. All the media, Disney funds a million media education initiatives all around smart filmmaking, youth media activism. It's there. They have taken, they're not just funding companies. They fund the educational organizations doing media literacy work. Now, Moses depressed us, and I don't want to depress us anymore. I just want to say, that maybe I want to th <laughs> I want to think about this more in terms of like what are some of the realities and how we can respond. Uh, so I'm going to do that uh, now, and I'm going to start with a very personal story. It's actually a story about my mother. Um, yeah, yes, because who doesn't like to talk about their mother? Like, we all love to talk about my mother. Something happened. Um, something happened with with my mother that I was involved in a couple of years ago, and it makes for a great case study of what I'm going to argue. The premise of my argument um, stems from the idea that, and this is where fake news will come in, it stems from the idea that um, a lot of the approaches to media literacy that we take and civic engagement, so Jad told me a day ago that the title of my talk was Fake News and Civic Engagement. Um, a lot of the ways that we've been approaching this uh, have been these detached, from meaningful sense of place, meaningful sense of identity, and what Meg said, like those forces of identity that connect us, that in my new study, in my new research, I've been focusing much more on how we leverage the personal into meaningful civic action taking. And that actually that's, in all the cases I've been looking, the stake has always been about identity and personality, and it's not been about detached criticism. And the story that I'm going to start is about my mother, um, not because I like talking about my mother, but also because I think it's a, it's a fantastic case study for us to interrogate. So I'll start with that story now, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the fake news phenomenon, and then why media literacy is actually the wrong way to approach fake news, that if we want to re-engage civically, um, we need to do that otherwise. So, okay, here's some cute pictures. This is my family. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go quickly through that, don't worry. Um, this is where I come, this is where my family comes from. Uh, they are immigrants from Greece who worked in factories. My father um, 
in the late 1960s was told on a Friday that he had to leave the country by Monday. And he found a boat and went to New York City with his family. And he was a late teenager. And he landed in New York City and then found a church outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And he started to build a life. Brought his parents over, his sister over. I'm very influenced by this upbringing. Um, I'm very influenced by the fact that my grandparents came and didn't speak any of the language and worked in factories knitting clothes to try to make a living. Uh, I'm very influenced by the fact that I grew up in a community, a Greek community inside the United States where we were constantly, um, we were constantly assimilating with different cultures. Like Meg said yesterday, this is something that I grew up with. Greek household, Greek values smacking into this new United States American perspective. And I'm, I'm telling you this because when I, at the end of this talk, I think it's really important to go back to what Meg said yesterday, how we actually think about meaning making, how we think about action taking, is closely connected to what she was pushing us towards. And it cannot be detached from this. And the minute it does become detached from some of our, some of our personal motivations, we tend to get lost in some of the larger structures that Moses was talking about. Okay, so um, this is my mother. She is, um, she, I'll just tell you about her because the story's fa fascinating. My mother was a, she raised four um, children, largely by herself, uh, and, she, um, and she was a kind of lower class family, middle lower class in terms of income, and she did everything she could to take four of us and make sure we had education and we had food, um, and at a certain point, she went back to university to get an education after we were raised, and she, um, she studied libraries, library information science. So it was somewhat close to media and somewhat related to what I'm doing. She um, went back to school. She took over a library in a school library outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And she had this idea as she was doing her studies and taking over her library that, um, that libraries and schools needed to be reimagined as, me as spaces for vibrant media. So she designed a model that I did some research on where she took the books out of libraries and she made them spaces where there was expression, production, community, inquiry, and sharing. Um, her library, this is what some of them looked about. She would have music sessions and poetry slams and she had coffee and donuts and it was not about being quiet. The library for her was about um, thinking and asking and creating and collaborating. She got a grant to recreate a school library in this way. And it was so successful that uh, she had, like in the United States, we have state senators. She had two state senators visit for the grand opening of the library. She had national researchers in media literacy and library science come from, from beyond the United States for this opening. She was in the national press for being one of the first um, librarian educators to recreate the school library into this thing called the Learning Commons. And she got a large grant to do this and she really recreated it. So that's who she was, and, and now I'll tell you um, why this story is interesting. So I got a phone call in, it was 2014. I got a phone call on a Friday from my younger sister, and my younger sister said that my mother had walked into work one day and went into the administrative office, and there was a police officer and a security guard and some boxes, and she was told to pack her things and leave because she had been let go of her jobs. This was in the year before she was retiring, and she was uh, 21 years, and she had one retiring in May, and this was like eight months before she was retiring. Um, and they told her she had to leave, and uh, she's a very beloved community, not only because she was my mother, but you know she was a teacher and she had done a lot. So, uh, so we all kind of reacted. We were all very angry. We didn't know what to do. We started to think about this, and the media started to cover this. This is the town she was in, school budget deficits, budget error, Chelmsford school officials get earful over job cuts. So we started to gather some information on this. There were a lot of people that were sharing things on social media. There was a lot of people talking about this in very advanced ways. People doing research, people hearing from the media, people responding. Um, so what we did, after a couple of days of being angry, is we just set up a Facebook page. So helping this out. So this is very strange. Um, the information said school layoff, but what we further found out was that there was some like errors in accounting and some uh, like budget manipulation for teachers that wanted like 
to do more with technology. So they were purposefully um, switching the budgets to try to get people out of the school. So what we did, and this is where I think, this is my thing for me literacy. We set up a Facebook page. We quickly got 1,400 people to like it. We asked them to start writing letters. They started writing letters. We asked them to start sharing their experiences and anything they know. People were sharing. They were doing research. They were sending us information. We had hundreds of letters from organizations all over the place talking about the importance of libraries. And eventually, after two weeks of this Facebook page being up, we realized we had a lot of comments, we had a lot of information, and nothing mattered. Everybody was sharing their concern. Everybody was talking. Eventually, what happened to this, this space was that people who had different opinions also came in and started sharing and started talking, and then the page started becoming about different points of view and a lack of reality. The story was lost. It was all different people fighting and communicating. We were at a loss of what to do, and it was a very, very, this is a very uh, interesting point in my life. As someone who researches media and community activism, media and community engagement, I realized that what I had been teaching about media literacy, like, okay, let's critique, let's analyze information, let's form an opinion, let's express it and engage in dialogue. Everything was happening here in terms of how we approach media literacy. But we were stuck. We were stuck in this social space where all of the things happening didn't lead anywhere. There was no conclusion. There was simply bickering. We had made videos and images. And I realized at this point that the way that we teach media literacy, actually in the online space, when you're trying to think about civic engagement, it actually reaches this place often. And oftentimes when it reaches the space of kind of online debate and dialogue, it doesn't go anywhere. It kind of ended. So we were stuck there. And what we did um, after seeing where this ended was we tried something different. We tried creating a campaign called My Teacher Matters. And we asked young people and the community to using these blue ribbons to come out and talk and to share pictures on Instagram with concepts of why their teacher was important to them. Giving the community something that they could grab onto that took them away from the social media space that allowed them to meaningfully engage in an issue that wasn't just about an individual, but an issue that was about teachers. And we asked them to come to meetings with school officials where they could actually come and articulate why their teacher mattered and why that was important to them. So at this point in, in this case, this was like probably two or three months after the, initial, after the initial firing and all this information kept coming out and social media had kind, of de had kind of degenerated into a lot of bickering. With this movement, we didn't get, we got hundreds of people in this town and the surrounding town to come and share stories and wear blue ribbons and talk to the community. What this did was take it away from the social media, was take it away from the online, what I would consider very media literate dialogue that was partisan, that was hard to discern credibility from not, where people kept yelling, and it forced people to engage in a very meaningful way. After this happened, um, the media interest, which had waned down after two days of covering it, actually came right back up in a big way with a new narrative. They saw people there engaging meaningfully around a cause. They saw people not just arguing over some facts, but they actually saw people call, caring for the values that they wanted to see in education. And then they started to recover this. Um, that's my mother's name up there. Should be reinstated for the betterment of all these students. Uh, supporters of Chelmsford School Librarian want position reinstated. The call became something different. It became not just showing their concern, but finding a way to ask for a capacity to act, giving them something to hang on to. So this, this led to another wave of support on a newly relaunched My Teacher Matters site, where from across the country, we had people talking about the value of libraries and educators. We had people talking about um, what they learned in this process. They're, they're talking about their past in places like Minnesota. People from, um, from outside of the United States were sharing and talking about these positive opinions. Uh, in the end, what this led to was a complete review forced by the community on the town, and the educators were reinstated. They got their payback and were able to finish and retire her career as a librarian. And then she came to our Salisbury Academy and gave a wonderful um, little seminar 
on the power and importance of libraries, which is really great and vindicated. I say this story not because the happy ending of it matters, not because in the end of the day, this type of community activism actually led to the reinstatement of an educator, but because this story represents something that I had been fighting for a long time and something that I want to challenge in terms of our media literate community. If we think, if we talk about being media literate is a way to solve problems, if we think that like when Moses ended his talk, like we need more media literacy, I actually start thinking about like, will more media literacy actually solve this political economy problem? Has more media literacy done anything to solve this? And if we keep thinking about media literacy as a necessary mechanism against some of these bigger structural problems, we might get lost in that same debate and discussion from a critical distance that I found was happening in this example without finding a way to meaningfully act. And I think that some of, some of what I found in here actually makes me think, what does media literacy look like when it's about going from this critical, detached kind of focus of thinking and assessment and creation for creation's sake to finding ways to be meaningfully embedded in society. And so this is the premise that I want to give to you. This case that, that I was involved with with my mother about what we did online taught me a lot about um, the discussions that were happening there were a lot of media literate people there from both sides. People who were doing their own research, they were accessing sources, they were really being aware of the issue, they were assessing them and deconstructing budget sheets, they were sharing them with others and getting into dialogue. And where that ended was this point of like stasis, this point of like, it just kind of stopped and everyone just kind of started to yell at each other and then drift away. And I realized like, there needs to be the other side of, of media literacy. This, we need to reimagine ways that we can use media to meaningfully engage, not simply to have this detached approach to media literacy that we always have. Uh, and so that's where my talk begins. Um, and I'm going to do it by framing it through this idea of fake news. Now, the fake news, I will say first, is a term that I don't personally agree with. And last night we had a lot of uh, very interesting dialogues on it. Um, and what I'm going to do with fake, I think the more we use fake news in less specific ways, the more it helps perpetuate um, some, like it legitimates the term and its political uses. So I wanna, um, I wanna put that out there. But I'm going to take us through some of what I think are the main contributing factors, structural and societal that are contributing to fake news. And then, um, not through trying to define what it is, but I, I will, like, I'm gonna leave that to someone else uh, later in the day to define what they think fake news is or how it works, but I just wanna set kind of the bigger picture of why I think the fake news is, is a great example of why media literacy is having a problem in actually achieving any beneficial outcomes in the world. Okay, so I have a quick question. Is anyone here brave enough to try to answer this question? Does anyone want to even try, do you like to try it? Okay, we have a couple people here. Okay, we have a lot of people that can define it. Great, so go ahead. Uh, we may think that uh, fake news are things that didn't happen and media say it happened, uh, but it's not. Uh, fake news uh, may have um, uh, 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 fake or false information uh, and also it, uh, it may be um, uh, that I tell you the news in my way. So you understand me in, in another, another way, in, in, in the false way. Okay. Okay, uh, so I can, uh, uh, you may have an opinion for something, uh, it's, not hap it's not happening this way. It's happening, but not this way. Okay, okay. okay. so things that, that either haven't happened or are happening, but not in the same way that, yeah. that we think yeah. they're happening. Okay, there's one. Yep, let's take a couple more. Go ahead. Uh, maybe it's a news that's not attributed by trusted uh, sources. News that's what? Not attributed. Yeah. Not, not attributed sources, to trusted yeah. sources. Or maybe it's um, some 
maybe there is one real truth happening, but people are exaggerating and saying more other things not happening. So maybe it could be inserted in a well attributed. Uh, okay, so it's so it's this kind of echo chamber. There's a lot of people voicing opinions around one issue, saying different things that happen. Sure. Yep. Maybe it's when we, you focus on one point of view or on one angle of the story, so you report a fake news, like for example when a protest happens, so you concentrate on, a protest happened with 10 people, and you concentrate on all those 10 people okay. and make a, a huge focus, then people will think, oh, it's a big protest, and it's not. Okay, so it might just be exaggeration or lending to some sort of spectacle? Yeah. Um, my definition is that it's an item that is planted in the news and it could be false or true, but the intent behind it is to achieve some type of an agenda for the person planting that. Okay, idea. so it's any, so it could be, it's something planted that doesn't, it can be true or false as long as it serves an agenda. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yep, someone who's trying to hide part of the news. So someone who's purposefully keeping things from being part of the news. Yes. Can I? Hello. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, my definition or my understanding of fake news might be underrepresenting or tweaking the reality uh, to meet certain uh, agendas, maybe. Uh, we have okay. a, a very famous uh, um, incident that happened a uh, few years ago uh, for a picture that uh, had the Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it was Obama so they just changed places they put uh, Hosni Mubarak in the front and Obama yep. at the back yep. just and they were defense was it's they are the same people in the same picture and it was a national um, okay. uh, newspaper okay. but in fact it's not the reality they were in that right. place but not in this right. arrangement right they they manipulated the photograph to change the perspective. This is a very exactly. it's a wonderful classic example of media. Yes. الخبر الزاف هو ترويج لاشياء كاذبه ليس يعني ليس لها مصدر. Right, untrusted or not attributed to reliable sources. Okay? Thank you. All right, let's just do right, let's راح احكي مقتطف من كتاب اسمه الصحفي في العالم الثالث يعني بتوقع انها اصدق عباره قراتها انه اصدق الاخبار ترمى في سله القمامه فدائما انا كصحفيه حتى بتعامل مع الاخبار تحديدا على سبيل المثال بفلسطين اذا بدنا نتعامل مع الخبر هو مش نفسه هو ما وراء الخبر الاحداث اللي حوالين الخبر هي بتكون الاشي اللي لازم يطلع للناس مش الجملتين العاديات اللي بيكونوا بالتايتل الموجود على اي صفحه او اي جريده right so looking deeper than just the headline and the lead and going into depth and trying to understand the facts okay let's do one one more الخبر الزائف هو الخبر اللي يحتوى على جزء من الحقيقة لكن يتم تجذيبها أو بإخفاء جزء من عدها لكن هي أكو حقيقة أكو معلومة لو يقللون من أهميتها يا أما يضخمون بها لحساب الجهة المسؤولة مثل عندنا بالعراق عمليات تحرير الموصل اللي صارت أغلب القنوات الفضائية تأخذها من جانب اللي تدعم الحكومة أكيد حتضخم الخبر ورح تتكلم عن تحرير وعمليات ضخمة تمت خلاص من داعش جهات مغرضة أكيد حتقل من أهمية هذه الانتصارات أكيد مثال right. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Maybe it's good that my opinion is the last because I'm not going to try to define me fake news. I think that my colleagues have done that already. I just wanted to say, because you already mentioned that you're against this term of fake news. Yep. And I think that um, I have the same opinion. For me, fake news are sometimes not a deliberate act uh, from the journalist, but just a lack of professionalism mm -hmm. from their side and sometimes also ignorance. Right. So lack of I don't mean it in a bad way, it's just no, sometimes no, right. the way the system yeah. works. No, so this is fascinating and thank you for your, I think what you have, I think what you have just said there in, in five minutes is you've described every form of um, media manipulation and propaganda and um, agenda setting and use of the gratification that has existed. So. Um, 
And I think this is fantastic because we had this discussion last night about like, how should we define fake news? Meg and I were talking a lot about it and I was going to set some context and then you'll be doing a workshop later with, with Megan, with Dr. Megan, and she's gonna take you through uh, Dr. Megan. That sounded good, right? Thank you, you're welcome, yes. Okay, uh, where she's going to actually take you through some of these ideas. So, uh, did, you, did you wanna say something quickly? Okay, we have, we have one, someone has a question or would like a comment. Um, and then we'll, well, then we'll move on to what I, how I understand all your comments. في في الأمثال العربية هناك مثل يقول كلمة حق يراد بها باطل. أود أن أضرب مثل على هذا على هذا المثل في الإعلام العربي في الفترة الأخيرة عندما بدأت الأزمة الخليجية اختلفت أقطاب في الجزيرة العربية من دول الخليج. بدأت القنوات التي تتبع هذه الدولة أو التي تتبع الدولة الأخرى تكشف بعض الأخبار ليس انتصارا للحقيقة أو إنصافا للناس أو لتعريف الناس ببعض الحقائق ولكن نكاية بالطرف الآخر ولتحقيق هدف سياسي معين حتى وإن كانت هذه الأخبار تنطلق من حقائق لكنها لا تقدمها كحقيقة وإنما محاولة الإضرار بالطرف الآخر Right, right. So there's an intentionality behind it. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so I actually think the more we include all of this in fake news, the more dangerous this term becomes, the more we legitimate it. So my quick answer to what is the definition of fake news is to ask Megan. That's number one, because I have no idea and I don't want to answer this. So you <laughs> So she's here and you can ask her at, what time is your session, Dr. Megan? Later, okay. Um, but actually, I think fake news is a very specific phenomenon. Um, and this is, so what, I think what we're talking about here is actually, I would argue that these are not fake news, what you're doing now. What you're arguing about is things that media has historically done. The idea of like doctoring images to recreate power structures has been done for hundreds of years. The idea that governments or journalists or media outlets will purposefully manipulate and omit messages to have a political aim that's harmful or benefits themselves, that has been done for hundreds of years. Why all of a sudden now are we calling this thing fake news? What happened? Since when did it become manipulation and propaganda and agenda setting? Since when did this all become fake news? This is the question that I've been interrogating for a long time. If we call everything here fake news, then what we've done is given legitimacy to say that the media is fake news. Because every media outlet in some way manipulates or distorts or chooses what information to leave in. And as my friend here said, they also choose what information to leave out. So the minute that, the, that these boundaries become slippery is the minute that you legitimate the idea that like all media can be fake news. And to me, that's very dangerous. So to me, fake news, fake news is actually, it is actually, in my understanding of it, it's a specific, specific phenomenon of the technological age. It's a specific phenomenon of internet and content and algorithmic marketing that people have been using to sell you soap and to sell you cars and to sell you anything to sell you, uh, to sell you politics, to sell you ideas. Which is why the people who perpetuate fake news in this technological age normally aren't, they normally aren't big P politicians. They're normally technologists who are thinking of ways to aggravate markets. And, and politicians simply hang on to some of these stories to help perpetuate and legitimate them. So I, I, let me try to take you through this. So fake news emerges from a technological age. Distribution and cost. The cost of publishing and distributing are, are zero now. The cost of distribution and publishing are zero. Here are some of the ways that I think fake news gets perpetuated. Audiences and trust. Given these much lower costs, reputations are far more expandable. When we talk about one of my perpetrations of this distrust, I said an age of distrust. When audiences, when, when these costs are zero to share and perpetuate information, trust in experts and professionalism 
become negligible. And then law and regulation. With much lower costs, far more operators are involved in exchanging information. The trickle of regulated information exchange through the gate became a tidal wave and one that's impossible to regulate. It's impossible to regulate. And what you have is technology companies like Google and Facebook saying, we're going to build an algorithm to stop fake news. What does that mean? We don't even know what that means. We don't know how that works, and we know that it'll counter all the algorithms that people build to make fake news, right? So that this is specifically a phenomenon of the technological age. And I will only accept, personally, the word fake news when we stop applying it to like all the media systems to see if they're fake or not. Because what that does, I think, is legitimate something that is far different than what's happening. We know the story about the Trump election and the Russian Twitter bots, and this is a phenomenon. How ways that, the, that this was influenced, and I won't give the full story here, and there's some great documentary work that's being done on it now in a couple of research paper, about Moses mentioned um, the Comcast bot response, right? And what, what the Russian Twitter bots were doing in the US election were finding stories that people were writing that were fake, and they would, re, they would put bots in place that would make them go from like 50 retweets to 5,000. And once they got to 5,000 retweets, then people started to take them seriously because that number mattered. And these, these were humans, but also not humans. That were just starting to building algorithms to perpetuate um, information regardless of its verifiable factualness. These were not journalists manipulating. These were not politicians that were just trying to create an agenda. These were bots built by hackers meant to advocate a certain agenda for a bunch of different reasons. Some of it being political, some of it being financial, most all of it being financial and monetizable. This, um, this is what they said, one of the, uh, this is what one of the, the hackers that was making a bot said, whenever you're trying to socially engineer them, meaning like US citizens, and convince them that the information is true, it's much more simple because you see somebody and they look exactly like you, even down to their pictures. So if you go to the source, these bots, create, they're like peers, they're like your friend who's just sharing these things. And that sense of peer relationship, we go back to that kind of, those, those, social, those sociological theories where we trust in our peers and our colleagues. And when you can create these, it's not a media source that's trying to manipulate you, but a friend who's perpetuating this, then it rises to a level, right? Here's another thing that happened in the United States. We had this big rumor of Macedonian teens that were profiting really big off fake news stories in the United States. And in fact, uh, the mainstream media covers this, right? And here's another problem I have with fake news. Um, many of the fake news websites that sprang up during the US election campaign have been traced to a small city in Macedonia, which is amazing, right? Um, so I, the city is, um, there's Macedonia, there's one of the fake news creators, and this, the city was like, I think it was called Velas or Vales, and it was outside of their capital. And, um, and here are some of his quotes on what he was doing. He was making tens and tens of thousands of dollars by creating fake headlines and then creating boss to perpetuate those headlines all over social media. And they were getting picked up and he was making money. And a couple of quotes I picked out from an interview, his name was hidden, say things like this. You see what people like and you just give it to them. Um, you see they like water, you give water. They like wine, you give wine. It's really simple. I didn't force anyone to give me money. People sell cigarettes, that's, they sell alcohol, that's not illegal. Why is my business illegal? If you sell cigarettes, cigarettes kill people. I didn't kill anyone. These same companies that Moses was talking about that perpetuate this sense of market capitalism and control that want people to be sharing cannot also be the regulators of the values that they share with. Um, these are some of the lines that they created. And what, Meg, what Dr. Megan will tell you later is actually like Pope backs Trump, Hillary sold weapons to ISIS, FBI agents suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead. These fake headlines on Facebook in the run-up to the election um, outperformed any real news on Facebook in terms of their clicks and impressions and shares. These headlines were outperforming the real news headlines, which is amazing. It's actually amazing. And there's reasons behind this. So what I want to argue about fake news is, um, is that this is the phenomenon of a technological age that has come full circle and that media literacy 
the way that we've approached it in civic engagement is actually not responding properly. There's a Penn State professor, um, Professor Sundar, who is at the intersection of communication psychology, and he's been studying, and he's been doing some amazing experiments on how people actually respond to news. And he finds out um, online news consumption for two decades. And one striking finding across the experiments is that online news readers don't seem to really care about the importance of journalistic sourcing, what we call gatekeeping. This laissez-faire attitude, together with the difficulty of discerning online news sources, is at the root of why so many believe fake news. What he's saying is that like, online, in these spaces where you're validated by your peers continually, people are less concerned with sources and more concerned with per, like, promoting a set of values or ideas that they actually believe in. And we could call all these people stupid or uninformed or not media literate, but that completely misses the point to me. You can't say that fake news, that if, I hear this a lot in the United States, if we had more media literacy, fake news wouldn't be a problem. And I actually completely disagree with that. I think some of the most media literate people are behind this, and media literate people are perpetuating this simply because um, they, they perpetuate a set of ideas, and they're not perpetuating, um, they're, not, they're not really concerned with critical inquiry. Um, and then, oh, and then Moses earlier today, told you that I was going to talk about this, and there's Moses from this morning. <laughs> and he's talking about fake news and Donald Trump. And this is where I think fake news goes from a very technological phenomenon that's embedded in the ecosystem of, of native content, online marketing, targeted Google AdWords, and the promotion of spectacle through social media into the press. The minute, the minute that this happens, um, the minute that this happens, and I'll show you a quick website on, on how perpetuating this is, that the minute that the politicians start claiming fake news is about all media, is the minute that, the, that, that, this, that actually it becomes profitable. So here's some good, this is, this I think, um, this I think is great because this is, this is, uh, I couldn't find one so I just wanted to show them all. Uh, this is, Trump putting CNN on the head of a wrestling figure that he beat up 20 years ago. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, and he's saying he beat up, this is, you know, this is Jimmy Fallon as Trump with the magic eight ball. This is him showing fake news. Kellyanne Conway, this is Alec Baldwin. And we can criticize Trump. I actually think this is so brilliant by the Trump people. They took over a technical phenomenon for people to market and created panic amongst all institutions for doing journalism for doing work that is never perfect and sometimes more extreme than other times but that I think is to me and again I'm just arguing this provocatively and I'm going to try to reinforce my argument to me is is it actually legitimates fake news being a, an entire media problem and not just a problem that's perpetuated by social networks and the internet and I'm going to try to figure out why Are you guys done watching these Nobody wants, you want to see some more of these? They go on and on, it's endless fun. You can just look at them for as long as you'd like. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna try to, um, I'm gonna try to justify this uh, in some ways. And then this I won't, I won't show you now, but this is the future of fake news, which is um, even amazingly more what they're doing now with facial recognition and CGI recreations, where you can actually take someone's words and put them into his face with another character actor and make it exactly real. You can get them to say what they say. So I'm happy to share that. When you get these slides, you can click on that if you want. I don't have enough time. So why is fake news emerging now? This is the next, um, and I'm, I'm, this is a rhetorical question. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give you. I have three reasons why fake news is emerging now. I wanna put this argument out there and then see what you guys think. Number one is the phenomenon of spectacle. This is the first reason, and here's, what, and here's where I think it picks up nicely on what Moses, Dr. Moses told you guys this morning. Legacy digital and social media platforms have become increasingly partisan, commodified, and polarized spaces of confrontation, where young people are subject to highly personalized information design, greater targeted advertising, and content focused on spectacle that breeds reductionist partisan expression. Yes. 
Well, so is, the question was, is fake nude a counterpoint of tabloid press? I actually think like tabloid press was super easy to take not seriously because everybody knew what a tabloid was and what a real newspaper was. They still bought it. That's exactly right. So that's a great question. So fake news is way, it's, I think it's, it's a great question. My, my understanding is that fake news is way more sophisticated than that and embedded in ways that are harder to see. But there might be something similar in what's happening um, around fake news and tabloid press. Yeah, it's a, it's a good comparison. So this idea of spectacle, um, Moses, in Moses' talk, he gave you the political economy of the content owners. And what I think has happened in the last five years is there's been a political economy, I call these the new legacy networks. There's actually a large political economy that's so much more, that's so much more difficult to see than the political economy of, of like the Comcast and the Disney's, right? You get their content. The political economy of these, as Moses said, these networks are not media companies. They are technology companies and they act in this space. They act in a space where they, they've actually commodified confrontation. They've commodified personalized information design. They've commodified target advertising. And these spaces have become the place where this fake news phenomenon has grown. And what's amazing about it is that the mainstream news media that we all can critique at a very macro level, they have to play in these spaces. YouTube is, is amazing. YouTube is a completely commodified space. It creates this feeling that we can all be part contributors, but it's really simply there to get us to give them information so they can, they can advertise and then find stars to build content with. YouTube is not an open platform for us just to be part of the process. Facebook as well. Facebook's algorithms are not any way intentionally trying to create diversity or civic engagement. They're simply trying to promote things that people will allow them to get more data from. And those things that they promote are things that they think your friends will like, and then they put you in touch with their friends. Things that are highly, um, things that are polarized because they get more hits. This is part of their, and when you ask Facebook about this, they say, we're a technology company, we're not a media company. So there's a new legacy of networks that actually perpetuate this spectacle. We had a, Moses and I were at a conference in Chicago in June, and there was a Facebook representative there who kept saying like, we're fighting the fake news phenomenon, but we're not an editorial company. We're gonna do what we can to help, but we don't wanna censor content because that's not what fake news is about. By not censoring content, you simply perpetuate this thing that you, that you lightly say you're fighting about. So I think we don't know how these things work. We don't know the algorithms. They're sensationalized, right? And there's a scholar, uh, Guy Debord, who was kind of a critical scholar from the 60s. And in his first line, I think he gets it. The spectacle is not a collection of images. It's not a collection of gifts, but it's a social relationship between people that is mediated by image. And this, I think, is how fake news perpetuates in social networks. Social relationships get built in these networks that are self-serving, that are for like-minded people to gather in similar places and share images. And it's much easier for those images to be reshared and reshared and reshared because, um, because you're always getting validation. When people say they like you and they like you, it gives you power to feel great. And it doesn't matter about truth or credibility as much as it matters about I'm sharing my idea and my value and I'm getting supported by hundreds of people or thousands of people and bots make that happen, right? If you get 200 retweets, great. If you get 1,000, great. Does it matter if the headline says, you know, the Pope did something to Hillary Clinton? No, if that's gonna put in your value, research shows us that most people simply wanna perpetuate ideas, right? So. My argument here is in digital culture that these networks that we think can be great spaces for engagement, they actually serve just as much to put like-minded people together to perpetuate values-based content rather than like thinking about some basic truth and credibility and like le level fact headedness. So I actually think you, this notion of spectacle um, is recreated, right? So you see this, so you see something like this. This is a frog. Um, his name is Pepe the Frog. Most of you know about this meme and what happened with Pepe. He was a frog. Um, there's, um, well, I, I won't show this video, but Pepe was, um, Pepe was a frog created in 2005 as an online cartoon by a cartoonist. 
and he was appropriated in the 2016 election by what is known as the alt-right to, um, if you do a quick Google search, you see a lot of different meme appropriations. He became a symbol of kind of hate and a symbol of, um, a, a, symbol of a symbol of hate and a symbol of harm and a symbol of xenophobia for so many. Um, and he was just a nice, fun-loving frog on the internet. And he became part of this massive spectacle um, where people were appropriating him and sharing him in like-minded networks where more people appropriated him. And it got to the point where even the president of the United States was tweeting this out. And then the media picked up, this is how spectacle works. And then something that, that's in the bellies of the internet that like-minded networks keep appropriating to get to a level of spectacle where the mainstream media acknowledges it, and then it becomes part of the narrative and the dialogue, and it's achieved its purpose. And it's a stupid green frog that was designed as a cartoon that gets to be, that, that the president himself retweeted, right? And used in a really bad way. And in fact, recently, in the la within the last couple months, the creator of Pepe tried to kill him in the cartoon and say he's done. He first he tried to save him and he called, he called him the Pepe, like peace, love and happiness movement to try to get people to reclaim him and that didn't work. And then he tried to kill him and the people who were using him started to recreate him as a religious icon that has come back from the dead. So that Pepe will live for those who want him to live. And this is, this is I think, the perpetuation of what Debord said was people's relation mediated by images in networks where everyone is constantly validating each other because that's how the algorithm is designed. The algorithm is designed for that validation. Okay, the second thing I'm gonna show you is distrust. Okay, and there's a, there's a lot of text here, but I actually think it's important, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read it. Um, this distrust has been around for a while. Again, this is what I think has happened to where the, the larger societal phenomenon that are contributing to fake news. And then after these three reasons, I'm gonna show you why I think we need to th rethink how media literacy works. A crisis of legitimacy has been evolving for decades legitimated by alternative media and politicians who openly question the legitimacy of our public institutions. In the US, trust in the mainstream media is at an all-time low and more deeply partisan than ever before. This deep distrust of the media is elevated by a president with cries of fake news. While startlingly obvious now, this trend is nothing new. Narrow casting and ideological extremes have catered to distinct factions in the media since the start of cable television, as Moses gave you that quote on and showed the video of Edward R. Murrow in the 1970s and with the rise of the web in the 1990s, contributing to what sociologist Robert Putnam described as bowling alone. So actually, this question of distrust has been around for quite a long time. And I have a, um, there's a recent report that was just published in 2007 and I'll kind of just show you like distrust of institutions, government, business, media, and NGOs, and distrust of media is, at the, is, is the most uh, stark contrast. Distrust in all of these institutions is failing. Um, hold on, let me show you one other graph that I wanted to put up here. Um, where trust is the lowest, action intensifies. So the more that we distrust our institutions, the more our action gets intensified. And then um, one more is here. Um, peers are now as credible as experts. So this is the other thing that happens in networks. When peers replace experts as the most credible sources, we see more distrust emerging in those sources of themselves. So when we start to accept the frame that fake news discredits all media, we accept this frame of, of distrust, right? Um, and one quick example I have of, of distrust is the Pizzagate story. I think my, some of you might have heard this as well. These are just some examples that emerged um, after the 2016 election that, that are where the fake news image is. Pizzagate is um, started uh, with hacked emails of a Democratic, um, former head of the Democratic um, or chief strategist for Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, and, the, and there's a group of an online, there's an online group that started to deconstruct these emails and in their analysis of them, which I would consider somewhat media literate, they were doing good critique, they figured out that 
Hillary Clinton and the Democrats were hiding an illegal child sex ring in the bottom of a pizza shop in Washington, D.C. This was deconstructed through them doing snooping online, and it actually became an amazing ecosystem and web of content that people filled up to perpetuate this. They started very slowly. They started analyzing it. They started sharing it in networks on Reddit, on Facebook, on Twitter, more people got behind it. The mainstream media, again, picked it up. The mainstream media could not be trusted. Politicians started tweeting about it. And in the end, this 28-year-old uh, from North Carolina, he actually came up with a gun and entered into the pizza shop. And he shot the gun a couple times, looking, for, looking to save children of abduction. Uh, one extreme example that gets legitimated by the media. This is where the problem comes. Fake news story triggers armed confrontation, right? So Pizzagate is an example of um, distrust in mainstream media to debunk stories. The mainstream media the whole time kept saying, this is not true, this is fake, this is fake. But once the mainstream media has a story, they're perpetuating, they're perpetuating the same story that the fake news creators, again, technologists and hackers wanted to see happen. Megan has, um, Megan has background on how much money this actually made for the people who kept sharing and resharing the Pizzagate thing. So for us to equate fake news with all the media is very dangerous. It allows us to accept this fake news frame into all of these kind of professional journalism that sources and, and approaches that we tried to maintain. Um, fake news, I think, is a, it's a reaction to spectacle which happens in these online places, distrust of institutions, which is funneled by technological spaces, and last is something that I talked about yesterday called an agency gap, which is an emerging gap between concern and the capacity to act. Okay, and this is, the, this is again, these are three phenomena that I think are directly related to the social media and technological age. There's an increasing gap between concern and the capacity to act, and I, and I wanna, um, I want to be very, um, I, I want us to remember that. This gap is perpetu emerging gap is, per is between awareness and action taking is perpetuated by a dependence on technologies to feel aware about issues, but without the ability to perceive pathways to meaningful engagement, okay? That these technologies, they perpetuate in their design us always feeling informed and aware, yet they offer few to no pathways to meaningful engagement. That story that I told you in the beginning about my mother and her situation was an exact example of the agency gap. People wanting to share and show concern and articulate concern and express concern and do research, all of those wonderful things that we think work with media literacy, but without the ability to perceive pathways to meaningful engagement. There needs to be that way, that connection. And that's what I'm arguing. And the way that I wanna, um, the way that I wanna do is show, show you a quick video um, this is every protest um, since 19, um, hold on, I'm gonna just put it in full screen and go back to the beginning. Okay, so this shows someone, some smart graduate student, smarter than any of us, um, mapped all the times that civic protests were um, covered around the world from like 1970s to present. And he put them on a map, and I'm gonna play you this map, and we're just gonna watch it. And so you see the date in the bottom here, I don't know if you can see this, that, that's um, starting in 1981, and you see those dots? Those are all instances where media was covering uh, a, a civic protest in the world. Oh, and there's an ad for a wallet. Does anyone need a wallet, or should I close that? Okay, um, so let's see what happens now as we go into the 80s and 90s. So just watch the instances of covered protest. And this, how, this I used to think was like, I used to talk about this with my students and say, look, more people are in the streets, it's great, there's civic optimism. And now I think this is simply, um, this is simply more of a reflection of what, what I'm considering an agency gap. And look what happens when we get into, so we're in the late 90s now, this is when the internet is, starts to be in everyone's home. And then you get into the 2000s and, um, 
And then you start to get into social network and personalized computing. You get more, more, you get laptops introduced at this point that are more affordable for homes. 2003 begins, MySpace people are there, Friendster people are there, people have GeoCity sites, and then Facebook comes, and then Twitter comes and YouTube in 2006, then we have Instagram following soon after, and then look what happens to the world. Everybody is, everybody is on the internet sharing a cause. 2011, look at that. What happens now? Everyone is sharing concern. Everyone is an activist now. And then look what happened in the 70s. It goes back to nothing. You could argue, you could argue here that this is a, you know, this is a phenomenon of more people being civically engaged. And I think it is. Again, my goal here is to be provocative in these ideas. You could argue this says that more people are civically engaged because they're, they're posting more and they're sharing more. My articulation is that what you've shown, what we've just shown there is that more people through these technologies are articulating concern. They're very good at articulating concern because that's how the technologies are designed. Sharing, reposting, engaging. I think that's good. I'm not saying this is bad. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is actually good. And I'm asking us, what happens when we can identify problems but not solutions? What happens when we identify problems and not solutions? We've seen this happen all over the world. When we start to become really good at identifying problems and not solutions. We see these protests all over the world, right? We see them from Egypt to the United States to Hong Kong to, um, to New York City. We see them in Greece, in Ukraine, um, and we see them in Britain. Sharing concern supported by online activity that's quite loud. On the other hand, we see concern like this, right? We see people showing concern in the streets, and we see people supporting that by showing concern through hashtags and through online stuff, right? Do something united for her, do something, do something, do something, and she's on the street, right? Click here to save the world, right? We are really good at articulating concern, right? And what I want to challenge us, if we really think about civic engagement, is to stop for a second. This is, as you know, this is Wael Gonim, one of the earliest bloggers who was part of the Arab uprisings in, in the MENA region. And he just recently put out a talk in a forthcoming book where he actually said, I once said, if you want to liberate a society, all you need is the internet. I was wrong. The same tool that united us to topple dictators eventually tore us apart. The same tool that we thought could do this tore us apart. And he gave five reasons why. And I think these are really important. And then I'm going to shift to what I think needs to happen to combat this. And I, again, I apologize, this is more of a lecture, but, um, but, but, I, but I, I think these are somewhat important for what we're going to do here. So number one, we don't know how to deal with rumors. They spread too fast. The internet and the way that we engage socially is not designed for critical reflection. It's not designed for pausing and doing deep dives into questioning credibility. When things come online, they come fast, they get tweeted, 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 and it's not even humans. It could be bots, it could be perpetuated in any form. We don't know how to deal with them. Five minutes and I'm done? Okay. Okay. Um, we tend only to communicate with people that we agree with. Online discussions quickly descend into angry mobs. We are forced to jump to conclusions. And our digital experience favors broadcasting over engagement. Posts over discussions and shallow commitment over deep interaction. So what he's arguing is that we used to, um, is that we used to have uh, much, we used to have much more control over these networks and they've actually, uh, they've actually um, ended up reinforcing some of the bad behaviors and patterns uh, that have stopped us. So I guess I'll end with this. Did media literacy create this problem? My argument is yes and no. My argument is that media literacy didn't create this problem, but it actually contributes to it. Uh, I'll read something here from some new writing that's coming out. The media literacy movement, as it's currently formed, has been unable to respond directly to the emerging digital ecosystem for information created and propagated by homophilous networks, which are just same self-serving networks, lack of trust in gatekeepers, and what Dana Boyd calls a return to tribalism, where we're undoing our social fabric through polarization, distrust, 
and self-segregation. And whether we like it or not, our culture of doubt and critique, experience over expertise, and personal responsibility is pushing us further down this path. And my argument here is, this is what media literacy asks us to do. Doubt and critique, experience over expertise, and personal responsibility over community engagement. This is kind of what, what I was saying traditional media literacy did before. Assumes a critical distance, it's skills-based, it's transactional. If we just know how to critique messages, we'll be better. Then, then the media will be better. I actually don't think that's ever happened. Deficit-focused, and it prioritizes individual responsibility. It says that it's me. If I can do this, then we'll be okay. It says nothing about the civic values that we want media to uphold for us. It actually forces us to detach from those values. We can look at bigger systems and argue for them, but we are detached. Um, and then, so I, I guess I'll end with what role should media literacy play in this culture? And I have five things. I'm just going to leave these here and then, um, and, then, and, then, and then be done for you guys to have lunch. Um, I think reimagining media literacy needs to not be about critical detachment, but it needs to be about cultivating agency. It needs to be a mechanism for caring. It needs to promote critical consciousness. It needs to promote persistent engagement and civic intentionality. Um, and these, I think, we need to reimagine media literacy to do these things. If we don't, then it's going to be individual responsibility and critical detachment. Um, so, and uh, I can share a lot more with you about this if you'd like, but I'm, I'm going to end here because I know we have lunch now and we'll get back on schedule. So thank you all for your time.